Namaste and in La Catch and welcome to this edition of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel. And as always, I'm going to go back to those two phrases, Namaste and in La Catch. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken, it's called Brahmi, and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Catch comes from the other side of the world, the Mayan culture, and it simply means I am another you. So imagine if you have that kind of knowing within you and you approach each person you meet with that acknowledgement and that reverence for yourself and for them. Imagine the kind of change that might make in your own life as well as theirs, even if you don't say a word. So just contemplate that, test it, don't believe it, put it to the test. So again, thanks for tuning in. This, this week's guest is Dr. Thomas uh, Legrand, who is just a, an amazing being that has been doing a lot of work similar to the direction I've been. Uh, and so currently he's working with Conscious Food Systems Alliance as the lead technical advisor. He's a former coordinator for the Forest Investment Program and uh, for Climate Resilience. And he's got a PhD in ecological economics from the University of Versailles. He's also written a book, which I highly suggest getting, and that's called Politics of Being, Wisdom and Science for a New Development Program, or Paradigm, Paradigm. sorry, it's even better. Thomas, thanks for your time. Thank you, Zen, a pleasure to be with you. So we had a, a little brief discussion, and, and I'd like to start out with how, knowing what your work, it has to have been impacted and inspired from an internal place. And how did that begin? What, what were the inklings that you got early on, and, and when did it begin for you? Of course. Um, my past started, um, I think it's somehow always been there, but I, I started, I would say, to, to recognize it more uh, consciously uh, in Mexico uh, 20 years ago when I was doing a student exchange. I spent six months in Mexico, then I came back. But the first uh, six months, I met some, um, some chamans and uh, experienced uh, a deep uh, reconnection to, to Mother Earth, to myself. And, um, and one, one night I was in a, in a ceremony with a, with a chaman and, and who became sort of, a, of, a, of an elder brother or teacher for me. And for the first time in what he was sharing, I could see a clear path. And somehow something in me recognized that that was what I, will, I had always looked for. And, uh, and that day I was, uh, I was able like, to put a name, let's say, I don't know, a spirituality or, of what was really uh, my drive, what I was looking for. And I, I, and I know right away that, you know, I wanted to, to, to follow this path. So then I changed really my life. I reprioritized that as my, you know, my main priority. And, and then this put me into uh, a lot of different uh, adventures and, uh, and works. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. And those shamanic experiences and the use of sacred plants and the entrance into other worlds that most of us don't even know exist. Um, the sensation of that though, could you kind of describe what that was like and how it, impacted your own awareness and consciousness as a result? I mean, you, you stated it kind of briefly, but I'd like to go a little mm -hmm. bit deeper and, and tune in to kind of those sensations that you experience that others may relate to even without the use of sacred plants. Uh, I think once I read a poem and I, and I said it was like a, a drop of eternity, you know, something... Uh, like sorry a drop of eternity sinking uh, in me and you know feeling that there was something uh, alive uh, in me maybe deeper that I was not aware before that I could now more uh, connect um, one experience also that was uh, very important for me 
Um, I was once in the um, mountain in a, of central Mexico in an indigenous uh, community and there was a, a big canyon and I, I was alone and I was looking at the other side and there was a forest on the other side and at some point I was I kind of there was it was like if I was there I mean of course my body stayed mm -hmm. there but I could feel, you know, I, I would say, I guess my energy was connected there. And I felt as if I was there, as if this forest was me, basically. And, um, and that was a very uh, profound experience. And uh, also because then I, I, I feel always, I've always felt very connected to the forest. And then I did my PhD in ecological economics on tropical forest conservation. And I've worked uh, uh, for a long time on, uh, on forest conservation. So you really followed that inspiration to its logical course of applying it in the world. And I think that's a phenomenal recognition and, and uh, choice to actually do so that is really relevant for the times, especially now. Now, uh, you know, I've, I've had conversations with others about non-dual consciousness and and so there's this sense of oneness right now for me in when i've been in those places somehow there was still a sense of individuation even though um, it, there was a sense of, of being in a collective right did you experience that as well what was there a you in that experience as well as feeling that connection to everything? Uh, I think I had different experiences. Uh, and um, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I have an experience where I could feel like there was not so much me. <laughs> well, sure. Uh, yeah. But you still um, were aware, so there was oh, yeah, a, yeah. a point of reference that you were relating to, which would indicate mm -hmm. that there was an individuation in that process, mm -hmm. even though there was this unity consciousness, if you will, that you were sensing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the for that, because that for me that was kind of validating, because I've often wondered, you know, this I we thing that that takes place and and. Mm -hmm. You know, even though we are part of that oneness, if you will, we're still mm -hmm. individuated and we have what uh, I referenced earlier as a perfected form, fit and function in the world that you mm -hmm. found through your experience of being willing to go there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a phenomenal and, and hopefully a, our audience will kind of pick up on that and maybe look into themselves and figure out a way for that for them to do it. So when you as you were going through your degree program and, and the the rigors of it, and I understand that I've got a couple of master's degrees in business myself, so I know how intense that can be. Mm -hmm. Were there particular things that occurred during the process that led you into the specifics of the ecological economies? Or did you begin there at the onset? Um, I think uh, at the beginning of my bachelor degree, I had a bit of uh, economics and I could feel like uh, that was a big um, influence in the world and a big uh, problem at the same time. So I've always kind of um, been interested in, in that part. And yeah, when I was, as I said, Mexico, uh, I mean, it was clear even 20 years ago that um, the environmental crisis would be the, the subject of all times. Uh, and uh, to me, it was like a bit like, you know, uh, just to be aware of, you know, in which uh, time I am and, you know, okay, well, that's where we are. And definitely, you know, the environmental crisis is, uh, e is very important. So I should um, dedicate myself to that. And in moments uh, of crisis bring opportunity. Mm -hmm. To meet those things and, and to mm -hmm. step up and and find ways to be impactful 
within it rather than succumb to the fear of it. Yeah, totally. And um, I think what I what I propose in this book, Politics of Being, is what I, I say that we we need a different narrative, which is much more positive than just you know trying to maintain the earth livable so that we can go on. It's more right. like about realizing about how this uh, cr environmental crisis and also social crisis, uh, even now we have a war now in, in Europe and there are other wars elsewhere. So all, all of these crises comes from also an inner crisis. So we could, uh, uh, we could be uh, much better. And if we are much better, we, uh, we could um, have a, a planet that, uh, that feels, and societies that also feel much better. So our well-being is not separate from, uh, from the well-being of the planet and from others. So I think that's a kind of narrative we need to, to wake up to. Uh, that can be very an, an inspiring uh, force for, uh, for change. Absolutely. One of my early guests, Dr. Robert Gilman, who you may be familiar with, um, he's been expressing the, the notion of being in harmony with self, others, and the planet for 40 some odd years now. And th th this is important. And it seems like, uh, I mean, for me, it began as a teenager. I prayed to know what truth was. I was willing to die for it if necessary. And I was seeking what my real purpose is here, right? And through the experience I had afterwards, I was basically told that I was here to help facilitate a new world order. Now, and that it would happen in my lifetime. Now, that phrase, New World Order, kind of has some precarious connotations to it with a lot of people. However, my understanding of it was, as you say, harmony among people and planet, right? And that we, there's this emergent, almost inspired activity that's now happening as a result of the pandemic and, and the global crises that we're experiencing, not just climate, but the what's going on in, in uh, uh, Europe now and, and how we are addressing this and, and looking at the narrative that's being presented to us and really beginning to question its truth, which as we study history and even Howard Bloom did in his book with uh, called The Lucifer Principle. It, it was a scientific study of history and how a few people manipulated masses, entire populations at times, by telling lies over and over by controlling the, the media. And that's the, all that the people got. And so they eventually succumbed to believing the lies. Now, knowing that, I think that gives us the ability to kind of seriously question, and maybe even put on pause our emotional responses to what's happening. And I think you're alluding to as well from the spiritual perspective of understanding that we've got an activity here that we can all take part in and it doesn't have to be catastrophic. You know, we, we hear about the apocalypse, right? And, and I would venture to say nine out of 10 people, you ask what apocalypse means and it, they would say, oh, it's the end of the earth or it's a, cat, a catastrophic event or something like that. But the reality is the word means uncovering knowledge, right? So here's an example of how this misinterpretation has taken place and it's filtered through humanity to where they believe something entirely different than the truth. So how, how have you seen this develop? And, and, in, and I'm sure you address this in your book from the highlights that I've seen of it. What are the, the components or, or what are the kinds of things that you've found that offer a different perspective that's a little more holistic? Sure. Um, yeah, as you say, you use the world, uh, new world order, and I know that it has some um, connotation nowadays, but I want to acknowledge that I think this was the expression used by uh, Baha'u'llah, the, you know, the, the prophet of the Baha'i, who uh, talked about, you know, this, uh, the, the um, humankind moving into adulthood uh, and the spiritual evolution of uh, of humanity, uh, which is something you know. I when I was a, a student in Mexico twenty years ago, I first heard about this Mayan prophecy of uh, of a change of consciousness in in, in twenty twelve. Uh, now you're mentioning uh, apocalypse. Indeed, a lot of people 
think we are, you know, that's uh, the meaning of the times we, we are in of great uh, transition and of the manifestation of, uh, of truth. And, um, and, you know, many, many spiritual leaders have, uh, and, and more and more, uh, <laughs> a lot of people are recognizing that indeed to go through, uh, I'm working for United Nations organization in their uh, United Nations Development uh, Program. The last Human Development Report, they say that we need a, a collective shift of mindsets to navigate this uh, transition. So, you know, even uh, these kind of institutions are now recognizing you can put it a, a spiritual language or you can put it something that looks a little bit more scientific, but at the end, you know, it's an evolution of, you know, hearts and minds. Right. And um, yeah, a lot of people have, uh, have predicted it. So how, um, uh, I was sharing with you uh, then that today my, uh, my teacher, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, I live in um, next to his monastery in France, and and uh, two hours ago I had some ashes uh, of him in my hands, like all the people participating to this uh, ceremony, and it was uh, a very deep meditation that we our teacher uh, offered us. Uh, because he wanted not to be uh, maintained as, you know, is um, in a vase or something, you know, because say, I'm not there, you know, you don't have to, to uh, and rather you should uh, offer my ashes, you know, in uh, to nature so that I can continue through nature. I can feed the, the, the flowers, the, the trees that are there. And so I was, you know, sitting there on the ground with these ashes on my ground. And I was realizing that these ashes were about to feed the, the flower that was just in front of me. And, and that I was sitting there like we were the three of us. And, you know, I was also part of the earth, uh, the way uh, I breathe, what I, I drink. Uh, all of these are not uh, myself, no, but they, uh, I'm made of these uh, non-Thomas uh, elements. Right. So, Thich Nhat Hanh calls that interbeing, and I think that's a new uh, paradigm that we need to uh, live by. Absolutely, and I totally agree with that. And I will offer the, a little more, even science behind that, in that looking at how our bodies develop. Okay, we have this point of light that's at the center of our being that I, I think most spiritual paths and even quantum physics now has begun to recognize that there is that focus of consciousness that bounces back and forth between here and the great light right and until it learns that yes there is this uh interactive quality and, and that our bodies are actually of the earth right all the nutrients that we've taken in to grow our bodies came from the earth so in a sense we are the earth we just haven't come to recognize that we are yet and so this new paradigm that's taking place is filtering through it in all kinds of different ways there's also a, a russian uh academian her name is valentina morovina and she put forth a dissertation i think back in 2018 if i'm not mistaken that she has gone through and identified all the various scientific discoveries that demonstrate we are in a global mutation at a genetic level even and it's causing this upwising and instead of a great reset it's becoming a great we set because we're all learning how to participate in whatever way we can right it doesn't necessarily change the division of labor it's just how we engage life and the attitude that we have towards it. So in your book, how does those kinds of things, and I think we're probably saying the same thing, maybe using a little, a bit different language and we're on the opposite sides of the planet, right? <laughs> Still, we're saying the same thing. Now, how, what do you see the effects or what long-term, short-term, uh, it may even be able to relate it to the process of, of the Mayan calendar. Um, by the way, Jose Arguez was a personal friend too. 
So that I, that warms my heart to be able to um, have that in my life as well. So how, how does this relate and, and how do you bring this kind of concepts out in your book? And what advice or, or what direction might we take from that? So uh, the book is based on, on, on two very simple uh, questions. One is, what is a, a wisdom-based approach to politics or human development? And uh, how, can we, um, how can we foster these conscious evolutions through, uh, you know, societies can decide through public policies, through the specific systems in education, health, justice, governance, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we, um, yeah, foster the, 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 this evolution that we need? Um, and I, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to be able to offer something that um, everyone that believes in this uh, can, can feel comfortable in. So I did some research to see, you know, what are people saying when they want to, uh, uh, people coming from a spiritual uh, background about uh, politics and development. And there's this sentence in the Earth Charter, which is a fantastic uh, document that I've been through a lot of consultation in, right. in 2000. And it says, when basic needs have been met, development is about being more, not having more. So basically our societies have been, uh, collectively, we have been mainly pursuing uh, economic growth uh, as we saw that, you know, at some point we probably saw that was a, a, an important means for fulfillment and we could say like it is up to some point, but when we, uh, uh, but it's not the goal, no, the end goal is, you know, being or human fulfillment or we could say you know, human flourishing. And um, so we need really to, to, to reposition that as, uh, as a main goal. And then wonder, you know, where does it come from? And basically there is a lot of good science that suggests that uh, our connection to ourselves, to others and to nature are key for this, uh, for this fulfillment. And, and, and this way we also uh, growing wiser and then we can devise collectively the kind of institutions that we need to enter into a positive dynamic, to grow uh, wiser people that can then refine and adapt better their institutions. So basically that's what I, uh, I propose and I show that there's a lot of ongoing um, public policies and systems that already exist, um, mainly based on what currently exists. And, and we can have a, a concrete policy agendas in many sectors for this uh, politics of being. We can make it happen uh, tomorrow. And of course, it will have uh, strong effects on our uh, evolution. Thank you, and, and very well stated. It, what I heard from that is that even in this, and recognizing that the, there are existing systems in place designed to probably do better than they already are, and that's more due to the mismanagement or lack of understanding of that um, human, uh, of being a good human, right? And taking it to the fullest extent where it concerns self, others, and the planet. We haven't really gone to that place. Now in this, um, I'm aware of, as a fact, I just became co-director or co-executive director of uh, Live and Let Live um, Global Peace Movement. Now. It was began by um, some lawyers here in the States it, with the notion of having a peace movement with teeth, right? By, by that, I mean that it addresses the legal and moral principles that we need to have in place so that these systems cannot be aggressive, right? The, because that's part of what's happened is there's been a few who wants, want to aggress on others, and we see that happening right now, and that aggression is causing harm to others and in a variety of ways. So how can we stop this? Well, the existing systems are there, right? And it's how we then become leaders in our own regions and bring this legal and moral activity into the community, into legislation, into politics, and 
it essentially take this notion of being a good human and raising the bar to a whole new level and that we're actually capable of doing so. So this is exciting for me to be able to relate to what you're doing, how you've presented things, and then, you know, because we, we may understand this, but how do we do it, right? What are the tools that we have or, or what's developing? It? And what's surprising is this organization, and I've just recently been gotten involved because of a conversation I had with one of the co-founders recently, mm -hmm. but it... Uh, even with that, without a soft launch, they're in 19 countries and they've got over 30 chapters already. So now the trick is, you know, how do we maintain the organization of consistency and saying the same thing effectively, even though it may be in different languages, but having the intention and the purpose go to the point of, of being able to take these new kinds of, of legal actions or legal, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure how, you know, uh, just getting involved in the legislation in order to move us and require better activity to take place. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's possible. How do you see that? Yes, sure. I've seen a lot of, um, I'm, yeah, a lot of, of, of systems and public policies that could be very different if we, uh, you know, a cultural change that we need is also a change in values. And uh, we tend to, um, when we are offer, uh, when we can reflect, we, we, we can agree, you know, on what are the, the most important values, uh, you know, uh, as, um, say, you know, goodness, love, peace, uh, uh beauty uh you know and all these uh values and you know when we say for example truth goodness and beauty these were the transcendentals from plateau and they were supposed to to shape the good society and 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 what i've seen is that this um new vision for society is showing up under different names through different groups mm -hmm. and we don't always acknowledge the spiritual dimension behind but basically uh People would talk about uh, systemic complex thinking. Uh, people were saying that we should harmonize uh, the way we are organized with how nature works. Uh, people are talking about happiness, about empathy, compassion, about culture of peace, about mindfulness. So, and I've, I'm, I show in the book that behind all these called call values, there are uh, new science, and then give us uh, a whole different story about you know, societies about our human potential, etc., And also they are, uh, they are entering the field of politics and, and social change. And, and from there, we can see a lot of different models that are for education, uh, you know, educating people, not only to uh, feed uh, their brain of uh, information, but rather to grow as a human being and to express uh, who they are and the best version of themselves. Uh, if we start to educate differently um, children, well, that would make a big difference uh, in the world, for example. Sure. Uh, but, you know, it's all about, you know, my, my main question is what uh, are the conducive, um, what are the conditions that societies should offer to people to help them express their full potential? So, uh, and that's the kind of society we should uh, develop, it's starting with, you know, family policy. How do we make sure that uh, children receive the, the love and support of the, of the parents and, and, uh, and the, the education that they need? Uh, how do we make sure that, you know, uh, in, in justice, you know, those that have uh, committed um, faults, um, can, we, um, can we have... Uh, systems that are restorative that can you know help them grow their consciousness and those and heal those that they have affected and bring the whole community together to be um to testify with their awareness of what has happened or do we just want to punish people and put them to jail so a, a lot of our systems you know are not based on the right uh, mindsets on the right overall uh, narrative 
And with this interbeing uh, narrative, we can reframe all of these institutions to support true uh, human development and the evolution of, of consciousness that, that we need. Mm. And, and I love how you framed it in um, being your best self, right? What is that? And, and we can always, and we're not perfect, right? We're, we're always going to make mistakes. We're, we're going to trip and fall and we get back up, but it's the striving to be your best self, to be better tomorrow or, or today than I was yesterday. And to always have that kind of attitude and address the opportunities that we have in interactions with others and even with ourselves and, and the way that we do things, so the, the discipline that we have in our own lives, this ability to transcend the challenges and knowing that the solutions are available all we need to do is ask the question shut up and listen because <laughs> <Right? laughs> it, it does it, it kind of emotes from that place now what do you see as being the constraints or, or the fears that may be present currently that are inhibiting the the growth and the understanding and the activity of getting involved Indeed, there's a lot of fear uh, that we need to, to transform. I think there are probably different types of fear. Uh, the basic level, there are uh, the material aspects. That's what I, I say that uh, it, it's very important also from this perspective, this evolutionary perspective, that all people can have their basic material needs uh, fulfilled. And, and they have this kind of security that is a basis for further uh, human development. Um, I think also fear is also the fear of the unknown because um, we are called to move to a very, very different world. And sometimes people prefer to die, I would say, with what they know rather than you know, jump into something that they that they don't know. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a very it's very scary for a lot of people to sh to see this uh, cultural transformation that is happening where they don't recognize what they used to feel were the bases of their world. And uh, there is a lot of fear, and people sometimes we see some cultural backlash that have a lot to do with, with that and that have, and that are fueled by a lot of different kind of insecurities, cultural insecurities, but also uh, economic insecurities as a uh, uh, scientific work have, uh, have shown, yeah. Right, we're, so what I hear you saying is we're basically afraid for our safety and security and that releasing that is a really uncomfortable place when you're used to certain to things being a certain way and now they're shifting into another way even though it could be hugely better mm -hmm. it's still something that's unknown and the it's easier to stay in the comfort of what you know than release in the uncovered what you don't even when it could be good for you mm -hmm. and it's very linked to our, our sense of identity uh, when we have, um, and this sense of identity can be more or less complex. Uh, and the more we are, uh, we are aware of the complexity, and I was mentioning, you know, interbeing nature, which is probably the, the acknowledging the sum of our complexity because we are made of everything, basically. And some say maybe we are. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe some say we don't have a self, you know, because yeah, we yeah, just yeah. made of uh, conditionings of so many in, 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 in so many ways. Uh, so, uh, but for people, it's difficult to live with this uh, with this uh, insecurity. It, it creates a lot of insecurity, and um, you know, people are very surprised to see how the world is uh, changing so fast now. Like they say, what are we? living in a, starting to live in a science fiction uh, world, you know, and... Um, in just two years. It's amazing that mm -hmm. kind of change. Now, and that's disruptive. Mm -hmm. It gives us the opportunity. Now, on one side, it's pretty scary 
because it is so disruptive. On the other side, like we were talking earlier, it's very opportunistic too, because now mm -hmm. we have this ability to gather and co-create something different or mm -hmm. a better activity. You know, the uh, some of what I hear is that there's this fear of the understanding of oneness, right? That you have to give your identity up in order to be part of this oneness. Well, I mean, that just doesn't make sense, right? Because you're you, I'm me, we mm -hmm. have different activities. We have, have individuated ideas and, and even though our goals, purposes and, and ways of doing things may be very similar, we're not mm -hmm. the same, but mm -hmm. we can contribute to something that is the same for all of us. And so it's, you know, this fear of this, of the change of the physical structures, maybe even of the existing systems and how we might be negatively affected by that. And we may be short term, right? Because there is that uh, seeming fall into entropy in the process of chaos becoming order, mm -hmm. right? Which is also a natural process, right? And it's like looking at things and being, uh, you know, the example that comes up is the swastika, right? It ancient symbol was one of the very first religious, you know, sun worshiping symbols. And yet most of the world, when you ask them about it, they're going to attribute it to the negative activity of the Nazis, right? So there's this little bitty piece that's affected the whole. And we focus on that rather than opening up to the rest of it and really trying to take a big picture view. And I think that might be, do you see that as being one of the stumbling blocks in elevating or, or expanding our interbeingness? Is that you mean, um, can you restate what you mean by, by oh that? Oh my gosh, <laughs> you said hopefully, a lot of things. <laughs> hopefully, because I don't always know what I think until it comes out okay. of my mouth, right? Um, so do you see this uh, interbeingness growing through this opportunistic event that we're having? Mm -hmm. And how might that, and I'm probably restating this differently, how might that um, show evidence that it's actually happening? And uh, maybe what evidence can you cite of that? Mm -hmm. very practical side of it i think a lot of of what we are going through as you said and all the crises are also opportunity uh and and there is always this um it's it's up to us at the end to choose you know what we make of these opportunities do we choose uh fear and and you know get more uh close ourselves even more or do we choose to uh, evolve and um yeah and and step into in, into the unknown and and start to to function differently uh the covid i think was um was really um it was a great opportunity i think the words that we could have was to uh, go on the same because we are going directly to you know to the destruction so mm -hmm. it was really important for us to have this opportunity to to stop and be able to and it needed to be through. a global crisis yeah for everybody to perhaps have a wake-up call mm -hmm. right? it's a it's a wake-up call and and what i see is that these crises now we have i said as a european i'm very um, moved by what's happening in uh, in ukraine and but this is just the beginning uh, we have a lot of crises until we are able to really do this uh transition that's you know you we see a lot of this happens also often at the, at the individual level where you need to evolve you know life Mm -hmm. uh, force you to to evolve, and that's what's happening also at the collective level. Because, and when you look deeply into the problems we're facing, it's really clear that they are very deep, and that they are calling for a very profound uh, transformation. 
Mm-hmm. Um, where I see also um, that happening, and that's um, in the title, in the subtitle of my book, is also that science is starting to tell us a very different story, and uh, that it did, um, you know, to for the last, say, yeah, two centuries. Uh, I, I, I use the work of Charles Eisenstein, for example, I don't know if you're familiar, he talks about the story of separation, but uh, from an, an, as an economist, we could, it's, it's very linked to this vision of, of us being homo economicus, uh, the way uh, economy uh, considers human being as fully rational and trying to maximize their self-interest. Uh, and, and that, we have assumed that we are like that, and thus our systems, especially our economic systems, is making us like that because we assume we are like that. And even the best um, scientists studying institutions say uh, that uh, Elinor Ostrom, she was the first uh, uh, no, uh, woman to receive the Nobel, Nobel Prize in economics, and she said the main lesson she learned over 50 years is that before, we were sure uh, people were trying to, how we can make people, uh, you know, considering they are selfish, how can we optimize uh, uh, their- um, Consumerism. Their, co- their coordination so that it can produce a better social outcomes. And it said the main lessons is rather how to design institutions that bring us out the best in humans. And so basically all institutions or paradigm uh, of separation is, uh making is making us uh is is bringing out the worst in humans and uh what people have said uh if you look back to um philosophers like um sorry uh, aristotle for example you know the the aim of politics is to uh uh water uh the good seeds in everyone so we are doing uh the opposite so now it's time really to design or uh, social systems so that they support what is good in us, not our uh, drive for competition, for, um, um, how do you say, uh, selfishness, uh, etc. Right. And, and I think you hit it on the head that the competition, the old paradigm is the competitive one. The new paradigm is the collaborative one where we all can't have the best unless we all can have the best, right? Which means we need to learn how to work together in order to redraft our proposal for living, if you will, Mm -hmm. and find that harmonic convergence that brings the systems in place into better order so that the distribution networks are more effective which then give that basis for, you know, food, clothing, housing, medical care, and and everybody has that same foundation. And I think we'll agree that in the world, all of those things are possible. We're not in a place of uh, scarcity, of which we're being told, pummeled, if you will, by everything around us that we are. We look around and and we're not, you know, there's this um, abundance that's available. And that I know in your experience with the shamans, you felt that. In my experiences, I felt that. I haven't necessarily been able to outpicture it yet because we're still, you know, in this negotiation between the competitive paradigm and the collaborative paradigm. And yet we're still moving that. There's all kinds of discussions like we're having right now that are happening around the globe and and that are even at some very impactful levels Mm -hmm. within governments to begin to foster this change. How do you see that? Now, let me, before I ask that, we mentioned fears and, and overcoming them. Have you had any personal fears in this that you've had to address and and dig into or drill down into to find out what they really are and how to overcome them? Could be. Inner, I think. So, yeah. 
Good. Now yeah. I think, um, well, I think the first fear I have was like, as uh, before I, I found this path was uh, not seeing a way for myself in the world because I could feel like what societies was uh, offering me. Uh, I could feel that would, uh, that was, <laughs> that will not gonna work. That was not what I was uh, really um, expecting and, and needing. So, and, Fortunately, I'm very, you know, if I look back um, 20 years ago, I could have never imagined uh, to receive uh, what I've received in, uh, in life. So that's uh, a good message to, to say to the, to the young Thomas, you know, don't be uh, too worried. You will see there will be a, a lot of uh, support and, and things happening in, uh, in ways you cannot, um, you cannot expect. Um, I, I think you mentioned, like you, you called your wife your your twin flame. Is that yes. correct? Then, yeah. Yes. So I have also this uh, this experience of uh, considering my wife as my my twin soul, and I was really um, unexpected to be able to to count on on that kind of support and being able to recognize that uh, my soul, uh, you know already knew this kind of love and, and, and wanting to experience that no and couldn't see uh, this kind of, uh, of possibility in what I was what I was seeing around. So that yeah just um, just an example. And, and I would resonate with that in the reflection of this re unexpected magnitude of the reunion and what it brings in the foundation of, of the sensation of connectivity right and, and that's not you know that's a simple phrase and yet it's so deep in unpacking it especially mm -hmm. in relationship with another where you've recognized that you're the same you know, mm -hmm. you're individuated, but you're, you're two halves of, of this reunion that as human beings, the one thing that I, I believe and have found true is that the bottom line is we just want to love and be loved. And to have that means a, a, a very deep relationship that is trusting beyond imagination. Mm -hmm. And the in the knowledge of the shared compatibility and and the ability to also rip things apart together to sincerely <laughs> question what's happening and what's going on and to have the vulnerability to do so and retain the trust that you're not going to be rejected by the activities That's, you have. Yeah, when you said love, I was seeing also the 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 feeling of being fully accepted uh, completely is very uh, liberating in a, in a relationship. It's uh, it's something very special. And um, in my in my case with my wife, um, it's funny because you know I because of uh, of the experience of what we are for one another, um, you know they are uh, I I fully accept her, and I'm even surprised. Because, you know, there are some things in principle, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily think of, you know, the woman of my life would be like that, but just, you know, it's just the way it is now. So right. I just fully, uh, fully accept that. Um, and it's complementary as opposed to contrary. Yeah. And maybe, you know, that's funny because, uh, yeah, completely. And when you say, you know, one of the big fear, you know, uh, for me, moving into a relationship with my wife be, after having been for let's say two years best friends i've been one of the most uh, biggest jump maybe in the unknown that we have uh, that we have done both and it was really uh, it created there was quite some fear I, I would say because it was really a jumping into the unknown because both of us were not the traditional uh, men and women uh, we had as boyfriends and girlfriends so it implies you know also breaking through a lot of conceptions that we had about you know about partners and also about uh, about us 
Uh, so that was a big, um, a big jump, yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, and I know for me too, it was, because uh, my wife's from St. Petersburg, Russia. And I'm an American from a small town and grew up thinking Russians were our enemy, right? Mm -hmm. Taught that over and over again. Found out, not so true. But however, when this cosmic conspiracy took place to put us in each other's paths, and I found out that she was Russian, even before we met, uh, it was at her Kundalini yoga teacher training graduation. Mm -hmm. And they called her up. I recognized the name as being Russian. And I'm thinking to myself, what a perfect, you know, my heart actually flipped in my chest. So I had these, you know, notions already in place of being open and aware that something was about to happen. And, you know, I, I was married before. I'd been divorced for 30 years. I got four kids. I got five great grandkids now. And still being able to have that relationship with someone from a country that's supposed to be our enemy just solidified this harmony among people and planet activity and finding out more that we really are the same. Now, of course, it, initially we had some cultural differences. We had some nuances, ways we communicate, the words that we use, some things were triggers, some weren't. And so we had to, to figure all that out, which was part of the natural process. And yet we knew beyond that, that we were anchored in this twin flame relationship and it was undeniable everything that we checked into right the, the litany of the, the lists and things that, that we you know there's all that kind of you know, trust but verify right mm -hmm. so being able to embrace that as an example not just to ourselves but how this is po and how this is possible with other cultures and, and not necessarily in relationship uh, as far as a male, female, or divine, or masculine, feminine, or any other, the the notion that we have that same ideal at the core of our being to love and be loved and to nurture that first, because that's really what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And we've had all of these things that have covered that up, maybe by design. Right. We all we can do is look at what's happened, and say, oh, well, this was probably planned and this is our next phase, which was probably planned. And now we just have to acquiesce to this process that's happening because it's part of the natural evolution of, of a planetary civilization, for one. Mm -hmm. Right. But most of us can't step back far enough and, and take a big picture view of that perspective. Mm -hmm. We're too involved in the day to day uh minute to minute activity and still in that place of concern for our safety and security mm -hmm. right so how can you recommend being able to pull back from that moment to moment insecurity and recognizing the security in the greater understanding and, and maybe acquiescence to the recognition of this is a process and we will get through it I think what's um, I think there's a um, there's a call in this process in um, in the book I mentioned this sentence from a from a chaman uh, which said um, it talks about the possibility to walk a path with heart and that's really as a as a, as a young person that's what inspires me like you know we are will not stay uh, that long uh, on the earth you know it's a small uh, it's, it, it, we will have to, to to leave at some point we have to die so can we uh, just you know make uh, that experience something that is uh, really nourishing and just you know answer this uh, call to to dare to to do things uh, differently and to really walk the, the the path with heart, which is the one that can strengthen us and the one that can uh, make us feel really uh, joyful, joyful and really alive. Uh, I think we are one of the fear, and some said, you know, the fear is often incurred into this basic fear for for death, 
and and our societies often don't want us to look in into that direction but i there is this sentence often quoted uh, i think sometimes they put confucius there or something like the some people they uh they live their life as if they were not gonna gonna die and you know they don't do anything special but those that think about uh uh that they will uh die at some point then they can make the best of the of the this short moment that we have uh, in our lives um so i think that's how i personally uh embrace what is going on you know trying to to be as much as i can and i know for me the idea of death is not at all um threatening um uh so i i, I can feel like trying to to do um as much uh, uh, as i can to contribute as much as i can to enjoy it as much as i can and i'm there is some bad scenarios going up there that you know may materialize or not for me or for the for the planet but you know it's all this at the end is just an experience and it will uh, it will pass so and it, it's dependent on where you focus your attention intention mm -hmm. and interaction as to how you'll experience it and the validity of this sense of, of care compassion love coming from the heart has a completely different sensation than being afraid of your neighbor mm -hmm. say right because any any kind of fear there, there's this constriction and what i've noticed is that when you commit to focusing your attention intention and interaction on positive aspects of life and contributing and working to be the best human that you possibly can and committing to a goal or a vision like mm -hmm. you have uh, and there's even others that uh, throughout history that have stated this in various ways is that when you commit to something the universe supports it mm -hmm. and it becomes almost a flow of activity that offers uh, it's like when you ask for something you know be careful what you ask for because it's going to show up right mm -hmm. so it gives you the ability to ask for things that are contributory to the process and then become aware of when they show up some of them synchronistically some mm -hmm. of them serendipitously and so there's this little extra sense of awe that comes along with it right mm -hmm. it, it kind of imbues it with this sense of comfortability with the unknown mm -hmm. right because these you can't you can anticipate these things but when they show up it's when they show up it, it's like enlightenment by accident right mm -hmm. so but to be able to experience that and then have that recognition of the sense that it offers in that moment that gives you an experience to put in your files and call up whenever necessary in my opinion because we have the, the ability to do so as thinking human beings we can mm -hmm. choose what we engage in our heads and we often don't make those choices right we just let the monkey mind ramble mm -hmm. and, and yet being able to still the mind be disciplined enough to choose how we think about things no matter how it may look in the exterior world it's part of that process that is beyond most of our understanding because we don't mm -hmm. have that complete understanding of the intimate goings-on in the evolution of a civilization so to speak mm -hmm. and, and i think we can also we can also decide to put us in service of what wants to happen and we know that we are the moment of this great transition for for the earth and putting ourselves consciously in service of this transition we can be sure that we will be used uh in that uh for that and we don't um, have to know what that is yeah. it's just the ability to offer ourselves to it right mm -hmm. i remember uh, i when i was uh 19 years old i was a bit uh depressed at that time and i remember a day 
coming out uh, from home in the morning and I was getting down the elevator and uh, and then I had an insight, you know, and just feel like you need to take care of yourself because, um, what was that? Um, if you can, you know, if you want to be, you know, like the, the best person you can offer, you will get some support for the universe, but it's just natural or it's just a natural way uh, of seeing that that work. And uh, yeah, I remember that was a big, um, that would experience. I, I have really this feeling that, you know, I will get the, the support from the universe, very clear, um, very clear feeling that, you know, if I could put myself in, in service and trying to be best person I can, I would be supported by, by the universe. And, uh, and I've often, um, in my life, even in my professional life, because I'm, uh, I'm an independent consultant. And, uh, before I used to often take short term assignments. So basically I was open for, uh, the universe to send me in any parts of the world because of my, the work I'm doing is, uh, it's international. And I had this kind of experience where I really get the, um, get a feeling of being thrown to uh, a, a place in the other part of the world and a lot of different things needed to happen to finally uh, be in that place uh, because there was a big um, ecological crisis uh, in that place and there were um, I believe the need for us to do ceremony prior to uh, help for that but that was a lot of different um, unexpected things uh, coming in and, I, and then I realized you know like I really could be, be picked from my home in in France and then end up in Vietnam and change even my my work through unexpected circumstances so that I can finally uh, end up in that place and, uh, and do that and do that work so this is something I can I can really uh, I have experience to be uh, used uh, and moved uh, by could call the spirit the universe to be able to to perform certain things yeah mm. and it you know this almost and i'm sure to some it seems kind of really new agey because it, it's kind of full of this what appears to be woo woo but really when you think about the prevailing energy right many people call it god or allah or some other what it is is just energy and it's neutral. It's our choices. It's where we put, like I said before, our attention, intention, and interaction that then draws that energy into, an old friend of mine calls it the momentum tunnel, right? That mm -hmm. it's where it supports your efforts. And like you say, you don't necessarily know what's going to take place. And oftentimes, you know, you move through the process and you look back and you go, oh, that's mm -hmm. right. And then you recognize it. The process is trusting enough in it to let go enough for it to flow based on where you put your attention, intention, and interactions. And that same activity also works for those who remain in the fear-based consciousness. And for us to offer that this perception is available for them to take a look at doesn't make them wrong right there's no judgment here mm -hmm. it's just a choice of where we put our focus and how life responds as a result mm -hmm. and so this evolution also includes a more disciplined activity that we're all capable of doing we just need to not be so lazy in our thinking, perhaps, mm -hmm. and be a little more uh, present, as Thich Nhat Hanh would say, you know, to be present in that moment. And what was Ogmandino said, it's the precious present. Mm -hmm. right? And it offers so many gifts. Um, how does this, how would the, the practical aspects of it maybe evolve or, or um, become more apparent to others? What, From your experience, what are the things that you've noticed that have given you the greatest um, dot connecting 
in it to where it's really made sense and it, it's anchored it into your experience to where that trust develops. Mm -hmm. I think in, um, it's funny, um, so my name is Thomas and uh, my parents call me Thomas because they believe it was good to have a scientific mind and believe uh, only what one can see, you know? And I feel my spiritual path at the beginning was quite based on observation and the scientific mind and just observing this kind of synchronicity, etc. But it was the beginning quite mind-based. And then I think what's, uh, as it grows, it's become more something of, um, of an, intern, an inner freedom, something more from the heart and, and this uh, availability to, um, starting in the present moment, I would say. Uh, and this, you know, availability to, to life, to, to what wants to happen, this openness that I believe can, uh, you know, make the, the spirit work through us more, uh, more freely. And um, sometimes I've even realized that sometimes I forget even things because it's best for things to show up, you know, sometimes I make mistakes just uh, so that things can happen in the way they need to happen. Um, so I would say, I think at the end, you know, this, what's important is this trust that you said, and that's something that comes from the heart that comes from, you know, the, um, the the James that you know uh, life can can offer and that can really uh, liberate you and we talk about love and being in, in partnership with um, or twin souls uh, I think that's a kind of experience that gives you this sense of of really trust and and uh, the space you know to, to really let go and, and flow with what uh, what we you know, what our heart resonates with. Right. It, and it often, it, to me, it, you know, begins, I guess, with a belief system and a faith that it's there, which we feel intrinsically. And the trust evolves because it becomes an experience system instead of just a belief system, because it, it's what's mm -hmm. happened and that's what you can rely on because it, it happens and the patterns mm -hmm. repeat and the processes repeat they may not be exactly the same however the general process and patterns that we all go through in that respect are very similar they have indicators along them that are ubiquitous for everybody and i think that's part of what is helping this understanding to come forth because there's a certain sense making Right? It mm -hmm. just makes sense. And now, mm -hmm. and now it's our job to make this sense common. And through our conversations and, and through our activities is how we're doing so because it demonstrates. It gives, like you were saying, it gives something for other people to observe and begin to question for themselves and then potentially dip their toes in it as well and find that river of flow for their own lives and in finding whatever their perfected form, fit, and function might be at this time during this period. And, and that may change as time goes on too. So what, what kind of advice would you give to those who kind of are on the precipice or, or teetering on the fence and wondering how best to proceed for themselves during this time? I would say, well, as I said, to me, really being able to connect to what's inside and what can bring them uh, fulfillment. You know, there is a, a way to live that may be safe and okay, but it's not responding to their higher uh, purpose. And, um, and so I think they need to uh, really be able to listen to that. And 
often what we say, you know, the, the small voice inside and the, the small voice inside, uh, it goes step by step. So you need to take the first step. And often people say, hey, I would be able to do everything, but not this first step. You know? <laughs> but the, so you need to listen to the, the, the small voice in size and, and more and more it becomes clearer and clearer, but you need to make these steps. Um, having said that, it's not necessarily uh, contradictory with the sense of observation and you know trying to, to see what can um, work in the world because things also not happen there's a lot of blessing that happen but it's also good to try to uh, uh figure out you know how the i don't know the, the new livelihood you want to to have or the new lifestyle you want to have there are some conditions that needs to be established and your mind can be uh helpful in figuring out what's uh, what's the best way so it's, i will not divide that too much but just be careful that you know, the, the mind tends to overcome or uh, to uh, take control and come as a lot of fear, especially of the unknown and, and, and can bring you back. So trying to find the, the, the right balance, but just, and I would say in this balance, the, the, the inner core, you know, what, you, what would really make you uh, happy and feel fulfilled uh, is what needs to be first. And then the mind can be uh, helpful in to figure out, you know, what the best way to do that, uh, and not the other way around. I would say. Very good yeah, and eloquently put, um, Thomas. I really thank you for the the time and the conversation. It was impactful for me. I know it was for you, and, and I'm sure it will be for our audience. And hopefully, it will give that maybe extra nudge for them to consider what is possible in their lives and start moving toward that as well. Thanks, Dan. Awesome. Great to, to, to be with you today. I really awesome. enjoyed our conversation. Very good. So namaste and in la catch. Thank you for watching this edition of One World in, your, in a New World. And I'm Zen Benefield, as always, I will see you next time. <laughs>